one of the things that I was not necessarily shocked, but learned throughout the course of the book was like we spoke of earlier, the, the, the true lack of Maeda's um, influence on the art of Brazil Jiu Jitsu and not necessarily the lack of, cause he definitely had, he was the most accomplished Jiu Jitsu practitioner at that time. He had the most clout of the Japanese that came over during the, uh, the, the rubber boom and the other things like that. But um, the idea of the narrative of him basically being the conduit that introduced jujitsu to the entirety of Brazil is maybe a little bit misleading. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what you found to be, you know, the crux of my aid is, and I got another particular question, but the, what the biggest part of my aid is influence on the country was. It, he, you know, Maeda is an interesting, he's a very interesting character for a variety of reasons. Like, he's the kind of guy you can easily, I mean, I'm surprised he doesn't have his own biography. Uh, you know, he deserves a documentary just about himself. He, he just, seemed like a pretty, like, it seemed like reading up on him, the more we talked about it, it seemed like he was just like an amazing, like, cloak and dagger figure that's all over the world, you know. Used international to be a samurai. man of mystery, yeah. yeah. He used to, you peeked around corners still because he was still living that life of the samurai. Yeah. It was pretty amazing. No, he, yeah, he, he's a very interesting guy and the stories that they told about him in the Amazon. He's a very popular guy. Everywhere he went, people liked him. So he was, no doubt, he was a very charismatic. But in terms of jiu-jitsu history, I, I wouldn't rank him in the top five. Maybe, maybe, not even top ten, man. Like, I, 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 yeah, dude, his, uh, like famously, his butterfly guard was shit, man. Like, he was always good. <laughs> it's because he's a, his true contribution to jiu-jitsu, we talk a little bit about this in the book, is that he lend his name to Brazilians who had no credibility, unwillingly. It's not like, oh, you can use my name if you want. Like, these guys were just, you know, piggybacking off his fame. I trained with Maeda, which they may have. You know, most of the people who claim to have trained with Maeda never presented any evidence for it. And that's not just Carlos Gracie. That's uh, Donato Pires dos Reis. That's uh, Bianor Oliveira. That's uh, Mario Aleixo. Uh, Mario Aleixo, just to give you an example, when uh, Mitsu Maeda visited Brazil in 1915, he, he was in Rio de Janeiro. So Mario Leixo claimed to have met him and learned from him. Just possible. We don't know that. We can't confirm that. Five years later, five years later, when Maeda's already in Belém do Pará, he goes to the press with a picture of him taking someone down. He's an Ogoshi takedown, right? And he says, this is Maeda. He's my teacher. So he's trying to, like five years later, when you've got to remember it, those days, there's no communication between Rio de Janeiro and the Amazon. That's like different planets, man, different galaxies, right? So they could get away with it. So five years later, he goes to the press and he claims that that was Maeda he was taken down. Now, you can't see the face. You can't see it was Maeda. But the guy had black hair, right? So people presume that he was telling the truth. I go, there's no way that was Maeda. There's no way that a guy who Maeda considered to be a beginner would be taking him down and Maeda would be allowing him to take that picture. You know why? Because these guys understood perfectly well what meant me applying a move to you and that picture ended up on the press. It's that's a hierarchy. And there's no way Maeda would have been allowed to someone who he just met to be taking him down and have a picture taken. It well, seemed like the like the Brazilian press had quite a bit of influence oh, in were, like in the country at that time. They were social media, they were Netflix, everything, they were Instagram, they were everything. Yeah. But they, uh, so he, clearly the guy was making it up. But I've gotten in arguments with historians over this. Because no, it was it was my I'm like, why? Oh, because it says right here in the caption. Like, That's what Mario Alessio told the press. Right. What do you mean that actually was my This five. is before anyone understood what fact checking was or any of those yeah, things. If someone cares enough to write it on yeah. a piece of if paper, it, if then, it's in the press, it's got to be true. Like, like this is Rob, newspaper. I'm sorry. These are very I'm sorry, outstanding but, members of the community. Oh, so, God, I'm sorry, but this paper now. clearly says that my grandfather, like yeah. uh, Bob Bradley, he's the one that actually started jujitsu. So, like, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, these God. crazy guys. <laughs> it's exactly that. It's that they they wish it were and they want it to be because sometimes they and I found myself being a victim of this too. It's easy to fall victim of that because you find the picture you want it to be true because that makes it a historically significant finding. And I've made this mistake too. I found an article. That you know claims it might have promoted five Brazilians, five Brazilians who most people have never heard of. Now, what we don't know in that article is whether he promoted them today to what we would consider to be a brown belt or what we would consider to be a black belt. That's what's not clear to us is what he promoted them to. Now, in my head, because I found it, I want to go. 
oh, I wanted to be a black woman. That's far more significant than my other promoting five guys to brown belt, right? That's not that significant. But a black belt would change things. So I find myself leaning towards that. And then I'm like, but I can't say that because I don't know for sure. So it's very easy for the historian to interpret things based off of things that would favor him, you know, because it would make my finding more significant than it would be in case it were a brown belt, not a black belt, for example. So everyone falls victim to this, but it's 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 hard to to not, you know, make you have to make an effort not to, which is a very hard thing to do. Yeah, you know, when I think about the contributions that Maeda had and the kind of the person that Maeda was listening to, you know, you're reading up on your book and listening to your descriptions of him. I think of him as kind of a person that, you know, was on a diplomatic mission from, from Japan, maybe a part of that diplomatic corps, came to Brazil to try to spread the world of, of the, the Japanese culture. And that was part of what they were doing with the world with Kano and, and the, um, and the in the inception of the creation of judo right so he comes to brazil and he finds out that like after a while you know he's one of those guys and you know a lot of these guys in bjj a lot of these guys are fighting that have been fighting for so long that like they're just over it you know they're doing it because it's how they have to make a living and there's a part of him that still loves the art but you know he came to brazil he got in touch with uh with carlos's dad and realized, okay, I can make a few bucks in the carnival doing fixed fights. And then his dad was said, Hey, can you, can you teach my kids how to do jujitsu? And then of course, throughout the course of that, because he had already made his name through the carnival. Cause obviously if you run a carnival, you know how to, you, you know how to put your name out there. That's part of the game, you know, the PT Barnum template. So as he started to gain this recognition, now other Brazilians who were trying to make a living as coaches would say, Hey, look, I'm with Carlos Maeda because he's the guy who showed me everything. He's got the name. He's got the cloud. In reality, they're just trying to build a lineage to things that just aren't really there. It's kind of funny because when you think about the ideas of fake black belts yeah. in today's society, it's almost like it's almost where it comes from. Same, same thing. <laughs> and, and these guys, you know, and they, they you know, if we, we – I don't like when people bullshit in general. Like I think that people should be trying to be as truthful as possible in general. But we all do, right? In those days, it was worse. I think in those days, like I'm almost like leaning towards like every martial artist in those days was was a bullshit. It's just that it was just so entrenched in the culture to lie and deceive that they couldn't even help themselves. It's just it. it I tend to not believe most of what they said because they understood that to make a living, they had to give the public what the public wanted to hear, and that's not always the truth. If you give them a real fight, they don't want it. Give them a fixed fight, they'll applaud you and pay you more. And that went for everything, right? So, you know, today it's easier to fact check people. And if you're willing to do the work, you can catch them on the bullshit. But back in the day, it would have been nearly impossible. Like, how, how, who's going to ch challenge Mario Alicia when he says that he learned from Mr. Maeda? It was five er years later. There's, there's no way you can verify that information, right? I'm, when, when you think about just what people have historically been willing to lie about, and you, you compare it to, you know, the relative unimportance or like lack of being in the, the, the world stage that martial arts have. I mean, people for hundreds of years have gone up to cathedrals and gone to Rome with like a, a finger bone and said, this is St. Paul's finger bone. Like, give me millions of dollars for it. You know, that people have been trying to graph and, and scam and and showcase something as, as if it were something else. With martial arts, I feel like there's a little bit of there's there's mechanisms in place that make that harder because if you say something relating to your ability to fight, people are going to try and fight you. And if you're able to win, you will be able to continue the lie or, or make the lie grow. So all you had to really do was know enough. And back then when no one really knew anything, it was easy. I could go back in time and be like the, 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 the red and, and coral belt master of the universe with my crappy anaconda choke, you know, like you, you it's one of those days. And yeah. So, so did you, do you think it was a problem of people learning enough and then realizing they could just go and do their own thing? I think we have a tendency to believe things we want to believe. Just look at, you know, just sticking to contemporary, you know, world. You know, people get stuck in their echo chambers. They read their news. And this is what I want to hear. Therefore, it must be the truth. This other channel here says something I don't like. So therefore, it must be a lie. 
And the truth is whatever you want it to be. And whether we realize it or not, we're all victim of this. Like I fall victim to it, you fall victim. Look, just look at the books you read. You always read the people you like. You never read the people you don't like. You ever notice that? It doesn't mean they don't have it. Hey, hey, Rob, I I think you're pretty awful and I read your book. So, huh, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> it, and, and it said something. We we're, we're, we lean, we, we're, whatever we are emotionally, that's where the facts happen to be, right? And it's it's probably the most fault victim, but we all do. Um, this is just going back to me, I just want to finish one point like why I don't think he's that relevant, even though he is interesting. In terms of what he did for Ju- the spread of judo, for that matter, not just jiu jitsu or what we call Brazilian jiu jitsu now, he is practically retired when he's in Brazil. Like he go, he has like he does some demonstrations, he's traveling through Brazil for the first year or two, he's there. And after that, he settles in Belém do Pará. He does teach class, but it's very clear on how much more present he becomes in terms of Japanese immigration. You can see him as he gets older. Right, because he's been fighting his whole life. You gotta remember he left Japan in nineteen oh four. So by nineteen twenty, he's exhausted, man. Like this has been a long I mean, that's just traveling. So he wants to settle down. He has a family now, he gets married, and he's probably leaning towards more profitable things, which makes sense. You know, like I lived a fighter life and I've taught my whole life. Maybe I don't want to keep teaching. And it's very clear based off the sources we have that he hands off the torch to these five Brazilians that he promoted, mainly Jacinto Ferro, which seemed to be his right-hand guy. Now, all the evidence we have points to Jacinto Ferro being Carlos Grace's real instructor. So what Maeda's really did for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, because it does start with Carlos in a lot of ways. Carlos is the, I mean, if you had to go back, like where did this whole thing start? It started with Carlos. Maeda did, what, what Maeda did, what he created the environment where Jacinto Ferro would learn, and later Carlos Gracie would learn some jiu-jitsu. I actually don't think he learned that much, right? He goes, he has a seven-year hiatus in jiu-jitsu between two, uh, 1921 and 28. There are no records of him training anywhere or fighting anywhere or teaching anywhere. And then he makes a comeback. And then, you know, his comeback is fighting Gio Moore, who in my opinion is a better candidate if you really want to create a link between Brazilians in the Kodokan, Gio Mori is a better look. So if you really want to be serious about it, you're better off with a Gio Mori picture on your wall than a Jiu-Jitsu Maeda because he certainly did more for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. We actually, we, it's pretty obvious he had a friendship with Carlos, that he they had a, you know, I mean, we, we can't confirm this, but given Gio Mori's experience and Carlos' experience, like you can't even, obviously he was teaching Carlos. There's no way that this was an equal kind of partnership, that one was, it was a student-teacher relationship. Very, I mean, I can't confirm it, but it's pretty obvious based off of what we know. Uh, Ideal more is a better candidate to be Carlos's instructor, in my opinion. It's just that we would have the reason why no one ever put Gio Mori in the spotlight is because he became an enemy of the Gracie family later on. And Maeda never did because Carlos left Maeda to Young and he claimed Maeda's an instructor, which is something that never, no one ever bothered confirming at the time. And now, Maeda is at the center of the story. My, my question remains, why is Maeda at the center of the story? What did he actually do? He did not spread jiu-jitsu in Brazil. He had few students. He taught little. He fought little. And then we have men like Gio Mori, who fought for decades. He's one of the first people to fight Balutudo slash MMA in the world. He did not infuse challenges. He would fight anyone, any weight class, gi, no gi, any rule set. The man would fight. And he taught Carlos Gracie. So why are we putting Maitsu Maeda on a pedestal? The real reason is because he became an enemy of the Gracie family. And once you become an enemy of the Gracie family in those days, you're done. You're done. And it dies, it's a sad story. He dies as a security guard in an aquarium. He has some kind of mental disease that they couldn't explain at the time. And he had a meltdown and he just died really young. But he was a security guard in an aquarium in a small city in the middle of nowhere in Brazil. Died poor. And this guy, if we were to create a link, like this guy's a better candidate. I it is very speculative, and I'm not going to get uh, any more speculative than than this. But you know, with he he was doing Valley Tudo MMA style tournaments. Oh yes, he was doing gi no gi Valley Tudo. You name it. Like this guy. Think, like, and if it was a mental disease, he had a, some sort of mental break. You think it might have been CTE? Like, is that possible? I don't know. I don't know because the press, the doctors at the time, we're talking. I think he died nineteen. 19- 41, I want to say. Yeah, they wouldn't even know what the hell yeah. that was. That we're happened. still figuring it out today. You they, know, go, so. they go mental disease. And, and he, he had one daughter, and that was it. He didn't have any great, you know, he never really learned Portuguese, incidentally. He's just one of those Japanese that never quite learned the language. 
and wow. the, the, but he he struggled and he struggled because of it. But uh, you know, and, and then we have others like Justin Fuchs, who's a better candidate. You know, so why is Mitsu Maeda the, the, the godfather of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? He's not. He's not you know, player. it's it's also important to remember that you know, and this is one of the biggest you know, one of the biggest themes of your entire book that there was way more than just two Japanese people that did jujitsu oh, no. in I'm, Brazil. At that time. I, I it was, it was a natural pastime and there was a tons of tons of Brazilians in the country. Yeah. I was unfair with, it. I mean, there's no way I can insert everyone. And I mentioned some names. I try to, you know, name drop as many people as I could. So people, if they're really interested, you can pursue that. But I mean, there were thousands of Japanese teachers. We even found one with the grandson of the last samurai. Did you guys see that? Yeah, I saw that. That was pretty interesting. I mean, that was completely unexpected. And I'll just give an example. There were thousands of Japanese teaching jujitsu. It was just that, you know, none of them would have an indirect link to a man called Carlos Gracie. And this is why Carlos Gracie is the beginning of Brazilian jujitsu. There's just no way around it. It's his ambition that created Brazilian jujitsu. It's not his skill as a teacher, his skill as a coach, or as a fighter. He was not a good fighter from all accounts, but his ambition to create something out of judo. And that is, and there's just no way around it. Like it, everything does go back to Carlos Gracie, but for completely different reasons than they even told us. They tried to sell us one thing and it was like, no, this is not how it happened. It did happen back to Carlos. It, it is Carlos Gracie, but he didn't do it alone. He's not the most, I don't think he's the most important one in my opinion. I think his son Carlson Gracie is more important, than, you know, if you ask me, but, um, you know, he, he's definitely the beginning. If you have to find a beginning for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it's him. Mm -hmm.